Well, hey guys, uh, we are going to start with our mission moment. Uh, this last Sunday of every month, we have a missions moment in our church service. Uh, it's a time to highlight the several missionaries and mission agencies that we uh, have at East River Park um, that we support as a church. And so I'm, I'm just going to quickly share uh, the list of those that we support as a church. So I'll just read it for us. Um, Ability Ministries, a ministry to enhance the lives of persons affected with disabilities. Appalachian Christian Camp. Chris and Kelly McMichael from uh, AM Air Kenya. They're a, a Christian missionary aviation team with six aircrafts from three bases in the east and central Africa. Christian Holy Land Foundation, ministry that preaches the gospel in Israel and surrounding areas. ETSU Campus House, campus ministry reaching out to college students. Justin and Stephanie Hemming from Go Ministries, ministry uh, working with local leaders in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Mongolia, and urban America to redeem people, redeem communities, and restore creation. South India Church of Christ Mission, uh, they're a church planning agency in uh, India's villages and cities, and last but not least, uh, East Tennessee Christian Home and Academy. Etcha is an awesome ministry to a group of uh, awesome young ladies that is dedicated to growing girls God's way. They provide a safe home, Christian house parents and staff, and biblically based academics to several adolescent ladies. They'll probably watch this, so your church loves you all, and we're praying for you all. Uh, if you feel led to give during the missions moment outside of your general fund giving, you can do so in several ways. I'll just explain that uh, to us. You can give online at eastriverpark.church slash give. Um, and then when you go to give in the drop down box, uh, there'll be several options. And one of those options will be missions. Uh, you can mail a check to the church with a missions moment in the memo line. And then 100% of the funds earmarked uh, for Missions Moment goes to the missionaries and mission agencies that I listed. Uh, so we're going to pray together for the work that they're doing locally and then around the world, and we'll pray before the message. God, thank you so much uh, for those that, that we uh, just shared. God, uh, ministry that's happening in this area and ministry that is happening around the world Father, we pray for a blessing in this time of, uh, of uncertainty and, and confusion about what's to come. God, that you would provide every need uh, that these missionaries and mission agencies have. God, that as a church, uh, that we're praying for them consistently, uh, that we're supporting them when we're able. Father, I just pray a blessing over them, uh, that they are doing a good work uh, to expand the kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We thought it would be um, great if we could um, worship together in this way this morning. We've missed seeing you all in church, and um, we uh, invite you all to worship with us here this morning.
Well, last Monday, uh, we had our normal church staff meeting, and I, I was making an agenda for that, that meeting uh, and printed off for everyone. And near the top of uh, the agenda, I have a calendar section where we list all the things that are coming up uh, for our church. Um, and I was, I was typing this, this past week's staff agenda. I paused at this calendar section, and uh, I typed for our upcoming events, and I literally typed this, um, well, nothing. And we, we had all these things planned that are now canceled or postponed. Um, next week would be our church anniversary picnic. That's been postponed. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea what, what Easter is going to look like for our church. Um, and it's not just our church, it's, it, it's everything, okay? So we signed up our kids for baseball. And that's been postponed. We had tickets to Disney on Ice in April. That's been canceled. And honestly, it's frustrating. It's, it's slightly depressing. This season is where things should be ramping up, and it feels like everything has stalled. And it, it, it triggers a question for us uh, that we'll answer in, in the text. What do we have to look forward to? Like our, our world and life might feel like someone pressed pause. Um, but as believers in Christ, what do we have to look forward to? And there's an answer to that question from the story in John 18. And it's gonna feel, it's gonna feel a little weird um, to answer that question because Jesus is officially on trial to be killed. Jesus is looking towards his death, but as we look forward, we can understand his purpose. Um, and so that's what we're going to find in, in John 18. So if you have a Bible, a digital Bible, I'll read it at ESV if you have uh, the notes uh, from the email that was sent out. Uh, and there's the notes, all the main scriptures in there. Uh, so we're going to be in John 18. I'll go ahead and turn there. We're going to start in verse 33, and I'll set things up for us before we actually read together. 
Jesus has been arrested in the garden. So the soldiers and the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, and they come with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Jesus is taken to Annas, who is, he's still functioning as high priest in this moment, but the conversation didn't go well. Jesus is slapped in the face. It's there that, that Peter, he's, he's watching from the shadows um, and denies knowing Jesus after he's accused of being one of his disciples. Annas is now, he's now furious and he binds Jesus and sends him to his father-in-law, a man named Caiaphas. He is currently the high priest. And again, Peter, he's watching from the shadows and denies Jesus, knowing Jesus two more times. And the rooster crows, just as Jesus had predict, predicted. The Jewish authorities are, are not getting anywhere with Jesus. They want him dead, but they don't have the power to do it. So it's, it's at this point the trial moves from the, the Jews to the Romans. The Jewish leaders haul Jesus to the Gentile headquarters of Pontius Pilate. They don't enter the Gentile building for worry they might be defiled and not partake of the Passover meal, but little did they know that they had arrested the Passover lamb. Pilate, he stands before this mob and he says, what accusation do you bring against this man? And you can feel the heat and the anger of those that finally have Jesus. Like this is the man they've been trying to corner his entire ministry. The man that has quoted scripture to them in ways that they have never heard. The man that claims to be from God and anger and death are on their lips. They shout back to Pilate, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered over, uh, over him or uh, him over to you. And you can sense the, this authority level between the two parties. Okay, the Jewish leaders and Pilate, they're not the best of friends, nor are they frightened to reply with, with such a snarky remark. Pilate is, is quickly, he's trying to excuse himself from this violent and messy situation. Take him yourself, judge him by your own law. And they respond, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. It's apparent that this crowd wants no further trial for Jesus. They want blood. Ne negotiations are over. It's kill this man. And all of it, all of this, every part of this was to fulfill the word that Jesus has spoken. So this wasn't a chaotic trial. Okay, this was the rescue plan of God through his son. It wasn't a trial from the people. It was a plan from God. And so Pilate, he, he stands before the people and he measures his next move. And so that's where we're going to pick it up in John 18, starting in verse 33. I'll just read the rest of John 18 for us, and we'll talk together. Um, so this is John 18, starting in verse 33. <clears throat> and so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me. And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not have been delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what's truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews, and he told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover, so do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The last point um, from last week's message was Jesus is on a kingdom mission. Okay, he's not 
on a mission to make our lives easier or for us to become healthy and wealthy. He is on a mission to set up his kingdom, which is why this conversation between Jesus and Pilate includes so much kingdom talk. Pilate wants to know what all of this is about and Jesus is about to tell him. So regardless of what's happening in your life, whether whether we're looking forward to things returning to normal, whether we're looking forward to a stimulus check from the government, whether we're looking forward for all of us getting together again, I want to focus on what we have to look forward to from the conversation between Jesus and Pilate. What do believers in Christ have to look forward to? And the first point uh, for us is this. It is a kingdom that is not of this world. I'm looking at verses 33 through 36. A kingdom that's not of this world. The conversation changes from Pilate and the crowd to Pilate and Jesus. And Pilate enters into his headquarters and he looks at Jesus and says, and asks, are you the king of the Jews? Which is a strange question to ask Jesus because Jesus never said that and neither did the crowd. Pilate is under the assumption that Jesus views himself in that way, which is why Jesus responds, do you say this of your own accord or did others say this about me? Obviously, Pilate doesn't understand what or who he's talking to or what Jesus is about or what Jesus is about to do. Pilate says, am I a Jew? Like, obviously not Pilate. And he says, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What? have you done? Now, don't miss that. Okay, so Pilate is trying to make this an exclusive Jewish issue. He wants no part in this crisis. But this isn't a Jewish issue. Jesus didn't come to be the king of the Jews. Jesus came to be the king of everything, including the Gentiles in Rome. So the question is, what have you done, Jesus? But it's the wrong question. Okay, it's not technically what he has done, but what he's about to do. And so Jesus responds, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, well, my servants, they would have already fought and defeated those that have come to arrest me. My kingdom is not of this world. Let me tell you why that matters uh, for us. The problems of this world are temporary problems. Okay, so what is broken around us will not stay broken. And I don't know about you, but I've, I've read maybe a, a little too much of the news lately. And I'm thinking like, how much longer is this going to last? How much longer will people suffer from a virus? How much longer will people be laid off work? But here's the reality from what Jesus says to Pilate, that the problems of this world are temporary because this world is temporary. So this is from uh, the Gospel of John, John 14, 30 through 31. It says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. But I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. So the ruler of this current world is the evil one. And the evil one has been granted temporary rule. Okay, so it's true that there, there's a lot of messed up things that can happen as, as to us as individuals or to our families or to our communities and to the world. Like e- even if our situation goes from bad to worse, it's temporary because the world is temporary. So over the years, I've, um, I've called my dad with tons of life issues and I, I can't count how many times in those conversations, he will calmly tell me, everything is going to be okay. Um, and I'm like, Dad, Dad, you don't, under, you don't understand how, how bad this is. Everything is going to be okay. So regardless of the mess in your world right now, let me calmly tell you, everything is going to be okay. And that's not some pep talk, okay? That is a promise of a future kingdom that's coming. It's a kingdom that's not of this world because the world's pretty busted up. It's a new creation and a new earth, okay? It won't be ruled by the evil one that is, that is hunting to destroy you. It will be ruled by King Jesus, not King of the Jews, King of everyone and everything. So what do believers have to look forward to? Well, a kingdom that is not of this world. 
Secondly, we have a kingdom that is established in truth. A kingdom that is established in truth. So verses 37 through 38 is where I'm pulling this from. Uh, We quickly move to a philosophical discussion in the passage. So Pilate, he only catches a piece of what Jesus was saying. So it's true. You are a king. Jesus answers, you say I'm king. This is why I was born into the world. To bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. And this is how Pilate responds. What's truth? What is truth? We are living in a world that wants truth to be subjective to the individual. Meaning, the individual gets to decide what is true and right in his or her life. And you, we're, we're just being judgmental if we press against any of that. Uh, and I'm going to be blunt on that, okay? Um, it feels good for truth to be subjective until a pandemic hits. Okay, so now we're glued to our news outlets looking for facts and we're watching the stats and listening to medical advice. Truth is not subjective nor relative to the situation. Truth is something we need and depend on. But what Jesus is saying to Pilate, like he's not saying I've come to deliver some scientific facts, but to deliver himself. So John 14, six says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Jesus came to bear witness to himself, the truth. And that is the heart of Pilate's question. What is truth? He's really asking, who is Jesus? No one can come to the Father and no one will enter the kingdom without going through Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Right now, we live in a world that can be confusing and unclear and constantly changing. To be honest, um, this uh, this was even last night before I went to sleep. I opened up the Google News app on my phone and I'm reading... Uh, articles. It's just difficult to find the truth about anything. One article makes it seem like the world is on fire and another article makes it seem like everything's going to be fine. But there is coming a day that believers in Christ will live in a kingdom established on truth by Jesus who is truth. Okay, In this kingdom, there will be no confusion. There will be no half-truths or suggestions. There will be no liars in the kingdom. Jesus was born into this world to bear witness to the truth, and he will set up a kingdom that is established on it. What do we have to look forward to as believers? It is a kingdom established on truth. And then lastly is this, a kingdom where justice reigns. Looking at verses 39 through 40 of John 18, a kingdom where justice reigns. The conversation with Pilate, Pilate's question, what is truth? It ends and he walks out among the crowd and he responds in two ways. First, I find no guilt in this man. Two, it's custom to release one man for Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Now that question is asked on purpose. Okay, we don't see it in the Gospel of John, but I think we see it a little more clearly in Matthew's Gospel. This is Matthew 27 Uh, 19. Besides, while he, he being Pilate, was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. For whatever reason, Pilate's wife has had a terrifying dream that has caused her to suffer because of Jesus. Okay, so she's pleading with her husband, have nothing to do with the righteous man. Pilate might have found no guilt in Jesus, but Pilate's wife has learned that Jesus is a man of righteousness. What she fully experienced in that dream, we may never know, but it changed her and she attempted to change her husband as well. And so Pilate, he shouts out to the crowd, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And what the Jewish crowd shouts back is so weird. It says, don't release Jesus, set set Barabbas free. And if you're thinking, wait, who's Barabbas? 
did I miss him in the story? Did, did we cover him earlier in the gospel and I just forgot it? Did we not go over it? The answer is no. Okay, we, we almost know nothing about Barabbas, but how the gospels briefly describe him in this scene. So I'm going to summarize Barabbas from all the gospel accounts in this way. He was a well-known prisoner. He was a robber and a murderer and participated in the riots in Rome. So, so stop and think about that, okay? This is Passover. Passover should be this beautiful time of remembering God's faithfulness to Israel and Egypt. It's tradition to release a prisoner. So we have Jesus He's been teaching and healing and feeding the Jewish people. Or we have Barabbas, who has been stealing, rioting, and murdering. The darkness in the hearts of the people cry out for Barabbas to be set free. They have been persuaded by their Jewish leaders to shout for the death of, death of Jesus. So likewise in Matthew 27, looking at verse 20. Now the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of you two, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, the, the, what shall I do with Jesus who's called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And you can just think Pilate trying to think through this situation, he says, why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. This is injustice to its fullest measure. Okay, the guilty murderer is set free and innocent Jesus is murdered. This world is full of injustice. Those who can't speak or stand up for themselves, they're ignored. Those that work hard, are often paid poorly, while those that hardly work have more money than we could ever dream. Those who try to do the right thing are forgotten, and those who do what are evil are made famous. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do those that dwell in darkness seem to do so well in life? Why do the righteous seem to struggle when the, those that are unrighteous seem to thrive? Like, Do, do you not think about that? Do we not think about that as believers? That there's, right now, there's celebrities and athletes who want nothing to do with God and they're chilling in, in their mansions doing some social distancing and we're stuck in a small house figuring out how we're gonna pay our electric bill. Like, you love Jesus, where's your payoff? And I wanna be clear that in the kingdom of, to come, justice will be served, okay? In the kingdom to come, Wicked Barabbas will not go free because the wicked crowd said so. He will be rightly punished for the life he chose. But here's what's even better in that story. Okay? In the kingdom of God, those that have placed their faith in Christ will be set free from the prison of sin forever. Barabbas might have been set free by the crowd, but Jesus will set and has set all his children free through his death and resurrection. There is coming a day where believers will dwell in a kingdom where justice reigns. There will be no faulty Roman trial. The crowd won't call the shots. Jesus, King Jesus will. The kingdom will be full of people that have been set free from the slavery of sin and no injustice will be allowed to reign in eternity. But there's hope. There's hope in this story. There's hope for every Barabbas. There's hope for every murderer and robber and rioter. There is hope for every person that has been unfaithful in their marriage. There is hope for every person that is being rocked by drug addiction. There is hope for every person that is looking for satisfaction and relationships and the approval of others. There is hope for every person held captive by sin. And the hope for the kingdom is not found in a crowd calling out your name. 
the hope of for the kingdom is found when King Jesus claims you as his through his death and resurrection. The crowd screamed crucified and little did they know that was the plan. Every believer in Christ has something to look forward to. There is a coming a kingdom that is not of this world, that is established in truth and where justice reigns. A few weeks ago, um, I found myself in our sanctuary here at church and it was just the middle of a weekday, I needed to be by myself and I had my Bible and I had a pen and I just sat in the sanctuary and I prayed and I read scripture and then I prayed and read scripture. And for whatever reason, I landed in Psalm uh, 112 and it's something I've read many times before, but it just, it hit me differently that day and I want to close with that Psalm. This is Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord how, or who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with a man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. So let me remind the church. We will not be afraid of bad news. Our heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Our heart is steady. We will not be afraid. We have a kingdom to look forward to and everything is going to be okay so let's pray together father thank you for your word uh, thank you for john 18 thank you for jesus your son on a kingdom mission uh, through a messy trial through standing face to face with Pilate, shows us a glimpse of a kingdom that is to come um, and so i pray for encouragement for brothers and sisters in christ that are struggling, uh, or Father, maybe they're just doing well at their home right now. I just pray that we would be uh, a people that have our, our minds focused on the kingdom that Jesus has come to set up. So God, fill us with encouragement in this season. God, give us hope for better days. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.